Good evening, and thank you all for coming today. So we're still in Joshua, and uh, the verse, or passages here, there's two of them, is Joshua 14, verses 1 through 15, and Joshua 15, verses 13 through 19. I'll let you kind of get there right now. Now, today I'm going to be going through a couple of verses um, to kind of give more a background to this story. And uh, the past week, um, I've been kind of thinking about what route to go with how to uh, not just really interpret, um, but really allow this message kind of seep into me, right? Because what's going on in this passage Towards the end of Joshua, we're, we're at we're towards the end. Um, they're they're divvying out the lands, right? The conquest has come; uh, it, it's now pretty much over. And so now, what's going on is uh, for the tribes that have fought in this conquest, the inheritance is going to be given to them. And so, if you read it late at night, you you could fall asleep. Because it's literally just boundaries. They're, they're just saying this tribe gets this and this northwest corner and this and that and a lot of uh, ancient Hebrew names and, and um, names are kind of hard to pronounce. And it's one name after another after another, northeast section, section uh, northern, west, south. And it, it reads that way. But in our section, something happens. An individual stands out. And that is a story of Caleb. And it's almost as if everyone in the room, I don't know if you all remember the Oprah Winfrey show, you get a prize and you get a prize and you get a prize. Um, it's almost like it's time to give you a land. This tribe gets land. This tribe gets land. This tribe gets land. And Caleb is just like, excuse me, hold on. I was promised something. And I hope you remember this, but Moses said, and God said, because I did this and I did that, there is an inheritance. And what we'll see is tonight, it's, it's, uh, the title is Patience. Um, so this past week, I was thinking, do I talk about the boundaries of the land that was given to Caleb? Or the histories thereof? Because that, that would take a long time to even just study that? Or do I talk about the patience and inheritance uh, thereof? So I was on my way to uh, school. I go to school on Thursday nights at Phoenix Seminary on Shea and um, basically Hayden and Scottsdale. And it typically gets me about 45 minutes to get there. And uh, on my way over there, <clears throat> I'm noticing my, the, the right direction, the left direction. I'm on the 101 headed north. So my right side is like the farmlands of the Salt River Indian uh, Pima uh, community. And on my left is our, you know, Scottsdale. You'll see the, the McDowell Mountain. You'll see Camelback Mountain. And as I was looking, and I had this story in mind, I was thinking, those are some nice houses on the mountain. And I remembered my time in the past years just hiking Camelback Mountain. You'll see uh, there's a house, there's a mansion kind of looks like a castle. Um, there's a couple mansions with many rooms on the mountainside overseeing everything. And then I remembered in Fountain Hills or Ahwatukee uh, Foothills, there's a house that sits right on the mountain. And, and it's like they have a tennis court, a basketball court, and all these rooms and all these mansions, big windows for walls. And I'm just thinking, how do they get up there? And I kept thinking about Caleb. And what we're going to read is pretty much he's saying, I was promised something by God for my faith, for my fighting, for my days of, of war battle. But because I kept on believing, I kept the faith, God said, yeah, I'm going to promise this to you. You're going to get this inheritance. So Caleb's is saying, I want this hilltop valley. I want this place. And as we're going to see, there, there are still people there. So I kind of want to go through that right now, and we're going to read about that, about this man who wanted a mountaintop. 
and what his story means for us as Christians and, and how that relates to the New Testament and pulling back the, the Old Testament as well. So we'll flip to Joshua. Chapter 14, verse 1. These are the inheritance that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua <clears throat> and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot, just as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses for the nine and one half tribes. For Moses had given inheritance to, two, to the two and one-half tribes beyond the Jordan. And again, this is kind of uh, listed out in Numbers and Deuteronomy. Um, so we're getting a, a recall of what was spoken to in the time of Moses in the desert, um, of how this is going to divvy out. Verse 4, For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim. And no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in. With their pasture lands for their livestock and their substance, the people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. They allotted the land. So, hard to follow that. You'd have to go back and pick it apart. Um, but basically, the, it's just a retelling of lands that are being given, given out to the tribes and retold again about the tribe of Joseph and how that split into two. Right, So let's give people these lands and this lands. And then verse 6, Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal. And Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, the Kenizzite, said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the man of God, in Kadesh Barnea, concerning you and me? I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word against Again, as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt. Yet I wholly follow the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trotted shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever. Because you have wholly fo followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while in Israel, walked in the wilderness. And now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me. My strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. For you heard on that day how the Anakim were there, with great fortified cities, it may be that the Lord will be with me, and I shall drive them out just as the Lord said. So Joshua's probably like, whoa. He's speaking to Joshua. Joshua, the head commander, giving out the land. Caleb is coming for what was promised. Verse 13, then Joshua blessed him and gave him Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, for an in, for inheritance. So Joshua was like, yes, I understand, I remember, I was there, you can have it. Therefore Hebron became the inheritance of Caleb. Later on, because he wholly, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. I underlined that for myself. Now the name of Hebron formerly was Kerah Arba, and the land had rest from war. I'm going to jump to the next verse here in chapter 15, starting with verse 13. Now we've got to remember that Caleb was just given the land, and part of that he was, he was we'll get into a little bit, he was talking about, um, this was promised to me. Moses said, I can have it, and also for my inheritance. So watch how this plays out for Caleb's um, inheritance, but also the legacy thereof. According to the commandment, starting with verse 13, according to the commandment of the Lord to Joshua, he gave... 
to Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, a portion among the people of Judah, Kerath Arba, that is Hebron. 14, and Caleb drove out from there the three sons of Anak, Shishai and Ahiman and Tamai and the descendants of Anak. And he went up from there against the inhabitants of Debir. Now the name of Debir formerly was Kerath Sefer. And Caleb said, whoever strikes Kerath and captures it, to him will I give Aksah, my daughter, as a wife. And Othniel, the son of Kenaz, the brother of Caleb, captured it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. When she came to him, she urged him to ask her father for a field, and she got off her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What do you want? She said to him, Give me a blessing, since you have given me the land of Najib. Give me also springs of water. And he gave her the upper springs and lower springs um, portions in the land. What's not recorded here, that this would play out in Judges, that Othniel would be the first judge. And a lot of this is partly as well as Caleb's faith and patience. So we read that Caleb, at this point, when he came to Joshua, is around 85 years of age. So Caleb mentions... Here, 85 years later, and we can do the math, and see, you know, 40 years ago, they were, they were in uh, the desert. And so um, it's, it could be likely that Caleb actually witnessed the coming out of Egypt. And he was there with Joshua when they spied out the land of Canaan. So he got to witness that as well. And he mentioned it earlier that when they came back, him and the first 12 people that spied out the land while Moses was the leader... Only Joshua and Caleb gave a good report, saying we can take them. We can take Canaan and the people there. While the other members that were with them said, no, we can't. And they talked a big fear game. They said, they're, they're bigger than us. They're scarier. They're, they're mightier. They got, they got fortresses. We're, we're going to lose this battle. I don't know what God was thinking. And still Caleb and Joshua persisted. So God told Moses, go back to the desert that generation will not see the promised land. As for Joshua and Caleb, they will. They will inherit it. So Caleb mentions a promise that was made after he and Joshua brought back a good report. And I'm going to read something else to you guys in Numbers 14.23. So this is what it was talking about for Caleb and this inheritance. So God is speaking. You shall see in verse 23 of chapter 14 and Numbers. You shall see the land that I swore to give to their fathers. And none of those who despise me shall see it. But my servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit and has followed me fully. He has followed me. I will bring into the land into which he went, and his descendants shall possess it. So now we're, we're talking some 40 years ago. That this is given to Moses, God telling Caleb and telling Moses, this man is going to inherit. So in our passage tonight, when they're divvying out the land to the people, Caleb's name is, is not a tribe like the others. It's a person. He's an individual at this point who had been living a faithful life. And he is of the tribe of Judah, but he gets his own plot of land. As God said so because of Joshua's faith. So Caleb's inheritance is his reward for his faithfulness. Caleb believes in God, just like Joshua and like Joshua and Caleb. Together, they were able to to please God's intentions, the will of inheritance of that land, to follow in God's will the path that he had given them, they did so by faith. So Caleb had strong convictions and faith.
And no doubt, the test of time, it, it helped to create a stronger and fortified faith for Caleb. Remember, at 85, he's saying, I can still go the route. I can still run that race. I can still keep fighting. Caleb saw God's great power. He witnessed God's great almighty power overseeing all the land and the people. So what we get out of this verse is this this intentional language of inheritance. Caleb comes to Joshua saying, he's not saying me, 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 I, I, I deserve this, I deserve that. He doesn't come off entitled. He's saying this is what happened in the desert. This is what happened here at Canaan. God had promised me, don't forget it. Don't forget God's word. Don't forget his promise. And as I was reading it, I kept thinking about the inheritance God has for these people, for for these tribes of Israel, for for Caleb. And there's a other story kind of going behind that. And and I want to talk about the inheritance a little bit, the inheritance uh, that was given to Moses, the the message that was given to Moses here. So I want to go back to Deuteronomy 3.18. And I'll, I'll read this. You don't have to go back and forth. But I want to kind of give you more information here so that we can better understand when God says this is what's going to be, it, it is going to be this way. When God says, I promise this, this will happen. We might not know when or how. We might not live to see it, but it will come through fruition. So Deuteronomy 3.18 And I commanded you at that time, saying, The Lord your God has given you this land to possess. All your men of valor shall cross over, armed before your brothers, the people of Israel. Moses speaking about the crossing into Jordan. There is Canaan, the inheritance, the land God promised. So that is being told to the people of Israel. And then going back further, Regarding the inheritance, we see in Exodus chapter 3, verse 8. And some of you might remember, this is that burning bush scene. So we have here in verse 8. God is saying, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians. And to bring them out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the place to, of the Canaanites. I'm going to go further back now to the story of Abraham regarding the inheritance. This is Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. And then in verse 4, so Abram went as the Lord had told him. And then later on in verse 5, and Abram took Sarah, his wife, and Lot, his brother, to the land of Canaan. And later on in verse 6, uh, to the land of Canaan, Abraham passed through the land to the place of Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At the time the Canaanites were in the land, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give you this land. So as we read from Exodus all the way to now in Joshua, there is this notion that God has said, I promise you, you are the descendants of Abraham, your descendants of Joshua, your descendants of Jacob, your descendants of all these people. Abraham is the father of you. This is your land. And as we read before in Joshua, the land has a spiritual tie. There's a promise here. God's promises of land that we just read and his covenant to the Israelites. Covenants that were made by God, it was contingent that Abraham and his descendants would do as God says they should do, that they would obey God. And only God can create this plan, this agreement. But this would require faith. 
Having faith in God and worshiping God was part of the Old Testament deal. Those covenants made between man, made with the Israelites in the desert, also with Moses, this notion of inheritance concerning the land. This deal or agreement was sacred. It was, it was spiritual. And it's that scene we get the Ten Commandments and the chapters following that, the agreement that all the tribes had to come together and say, yes, we agree. We want God to be our God. We want God to save us. We want God to, to make us a nation. We want the promises of Abraham. We want that. And it says almost God says, okay, then so, so be it. I will be there for you. I will protect you. I will be your God. But you have to follow these things. You have to live in my way. And God doesn't tell them yet, but he's planning to make them ready for the ultimate kingdom, which Christ talks about. This inheritance of land became sacred. It became spiritual. The land that was promised of milk and honey became sacred. God wants this for us. The land that Joshua and Caleb and the 12 tribes of Israel fought for was more than just land. It was a treasure. It was to be their home. It meant that they could be a nation, but more than that, it meant that God is truly all-powerful and never breaks or falls back on his covenants or his word or his promises. Caleb continues the legacy of faith in God by passing it to his daughter and her husband, Othaniel, who becomes that judge. The legacy of Caleb's faith in God continues into the book of Judges. What does this mean for us? Caleb said, hey, I was promised something. God said so. Joshua could have said, I forgot about that deal. Can can you show me? were in the text or an email or some legal documents explaining that, please? You know, how many of us have gone to our bosses at work to ask for a raise? I know that's comparing something completely different. But to go that route and say, I'm, I'm ready for this, not being entitled, but knowing you deserve it because of your, your hard work and your faith and your commitment to the administration or to to the agency you're working for. I put in time. I'm 85 years old. I put in time. Oh, you know, we forgot to sign off on that. We expect integrity and reliability from God, from from his word. Joshua he saw that and noticed that and said, you know what, yes, you're, you're right. Have Hebron. Have what you, what you want. But do we expect the same from other Christians, that integrity, that reliability? Do we accept it from people we know, other Christians or even pastors? Do you accept that or expect it from Peter Molina? from Pastor Rob, Pastor Chris? Do we fall back on our word and our promises, our integrity? How about you? Is your word this reliable that after 40-some years, you would remember this and say, yeah, you're right. God will and God does. Even today, he is honoring promises he had made thousands of years ago. And some of his greatest promises are waiting to yet be fulfilled. Our faith in God grows as we faithfully wait for his promises in our lives. But there are some issues, though. I can see it now. I'm Christian. I deserve this. I want that house on the hilltop. I want that nice car, or I want this, or I want that. I deserve this. Let me, let me name it or claim it. God says so. God wills it. And then it doesn't happen. 
we might be faithful to the letter. We live out so many odd years of our life, 40, 50 years, expecting something great to happen because we followed Christ, we followed God. Can you imagine the first five centuries after Christ was resurrected, after he died and was re- resurrected, all those people who were persecuted by Rome? But I was faithful. I was faithful. We might not get to see the things we wished for, things we pray for, because the world we live in isn't perfect. It's a sinful world, and, and we are sinners. We live amongst other sinners. And we sometimes can fall into this pit where we think everything's perfect, everything's good, everything's righteous. People are perfect. And then the day comes when we're betrayed or something bad happens to us on purpose or unintentionally. Right right away we fall back in our faith. I've seen this with family members who were divorced who no longer go to church, who no longer pray or read their Bible, who don't believe in God no more. They had lived a life of being a youth director, of going to church 24-7. They have given their life. They got baptized. And because of a divorce that nearly split an entire family, the belief was no longer there. Because I thought God was supposed to be involved. I thought God was supposed to keep those things together. He promises. There's inheritance. There's blessings. So it kind of sucks sometimes when we're in need of a counselor and someone comes to us and says, just have faith. That's hard to hear that. And I know that's not what's going on with Caleb's situation here because his brother, Joshua, his brother in faith, Joshua, is with him on this. He's not going to fall back on Caleb right now. Caleb, you're right. God is in the room. God's spirit is overseeing everything. Caleb gets that Hebron, gets that land. That doesn't always happen in our walk. Sometimes it does. That's amazing when it does. It's huge. It's huge when it does. My wife and I right now, we're church planners. And one of the things that we're doing is we're raising funds and donations to plant a church in Guadalupe. And one of the things that I kind of fall back on sometimes is knowing how everything was as I was being raised But now seeing how so many people are asking questions that will direct the conversation to where is Jesus in all of this? Where is God? Where is Jesus? Didn't he promise good stuff to come? And so I think about that and pray about it. And one time this happened where I'm praying over somebody in my life and I knew he was going through stuff. He called me about maybe an hour or two hours later wanting to talk about the thing I was praying over him for. Now, it might not have been the land or the hilltop on Camelback Mountain, but it was something far much much more better. There's something I want to read to you guys, and I got a couple of things to talk more about. But before the time ends, um, one of the things I want you guys to kind of walk away from is, is the faith. Faith that Caleb had. His faith throughout time. God's inheritance. The Israelites lived in a certain way that they knew if they messed up, God wouldn't be there for them. And we see this as a cycle in Judges. We see that cycle So faith in God, the inheritance thereof, treasure in heaven, 
and our inheritance through Christ. So, speaking of faith, I want to turn to Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, this is New Testament. Now, faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Later on, Paul writes about these heroes of faith. By faith, Abel offered to God. By faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out of that place to oversee Canaan, to go to receive that inheritance. By faith, Sarah herself received power to conceive. In verse 13, these all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from far away, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on earth. For people who speak thus make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they had been thinking of that land from which they had gone out, they would have had opportunity to return. But as it is, they desire a better country that is a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Many of you guys know that he's talking about heaven. Heaven. So Paul is saying, hey, I know these heroes of faith. I study them. I know who they are. And I want you to tell you something. They lived and died by faith. That God, through Christ, has gone out to create a heavenly city, a heavenly homeland. That that should be your reward, your promise, your inheritance, your target, your focus. In verse 29, by faith, the people crossed the Red Sea on dry land. Verse 30, by faith, the walls of Jericho fell down. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish. By faith. In chapter 12, verse 1, Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, all those great heroes, let us all lay aside every weight and sin which clings so closely to us, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Caleb was running that race. And at 85, he said, I can keep going. I can keep going. I won't stop. I'm 85, but I'm strong like I was back 40 years ago. And I will throw down at the hilltop. I will go back, and if God wills it, he's with me, he knows it, I will have victory. So he's saying for us, the message for us here, that victory is still there. Now, it may not be a, a hilltop on Camelback Mountain, but it's the hilltop in heaven. Heaven is the focus. Heaven is the target this story of an inheritance, the land of milk and honey. It's a direct picture of what we as Christians today would view our inheritance of milk and honey being in heaven. In Romans chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, Paul writes that it is by faith that we gain the same promises that were made to Abraham. So now we're calling back Genesis. So Paul is reaching back into time. Thousands of years ago, when the first covenant was made about the inheritance of land, regarding the law, Paul is saying because of Christ, it is by faith we can gain that inheritance, those promises made to Abraham. It is by faith we are adopted. Through faith we gain inheritance that Jesus gives to us because of his sacrifice. And by faith in Christ, God promises us salvation. We believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. We repent and live for God. Sounds a lot like Caleb. We are to live our lives, no matter how short or how long, by faith in God, through the salvation of Jesus Christ, we are given a divine king God in flesh, that we can worship directly. Keep the faith. Keep running your race. And we'll see each other 
on the finish line where we'll celebrate the promises of God. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for this message, Lord. Thank you um, that you have given us a fighting chance, Lord, to gain the inheritance that you've given to Abraham, Lord. Lord, thank you for your salvation, your sacrifice. Thank you for being Jesus, Lord. We need a Savior, Lord. We need, we need an end goal, Lord, to live for. And thank you for giving us something to live for. Thank you, Lord, for bringing us all here today. And thank you for your son, Caleb, who today is still a great example of how we should live life and how we should end it. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.